Hi there. Um, my name is Kim Lohman, and um, I'm with these two fine, impressive gentlemen, gentlemen that are have dealings and some fabulous stories, I'm sure, of my dad, Al Lohman. There's Chris Roberts. Good to and, be here. Uh, there, there, look at that handsome devil there. And Johnny Kay, another Hi, gentleman I get to talk to today. Um, so we're here. It's a Sunday after or Saturday afternoon. I don't even know what day it is. So tell me a little bit about uh, you guys working with Loman and Barkley. Well, the, the big thing for me uh, being in sports and uh, I was really fortunate to have Johnny as the boss and as the program director of both AM and FM. KFI, the greatest three call letter radio station in America. Yes, as a matter of fact, look at this. Beautiful. It is. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. It was, it Two of the greatest big... guys I've ever worked with, but uh, thank goodness Johnny was running both KFI and Coast 103, which is love songs on the coast. <laughs> something Johnny developed and just really maxed it out and it's still doing it too in LA but um, I became the sports director for KFI thank you Johnny and being with Loman and Barkley the kings of morning show radio it just opened up the credibility door for me and it was like God, this guy is a sportscaster. He's not a disc jockey anymore. And I had to make that transition. And uh, they're really responsible for me eventually becoming the voice of the UCLA Bruins for Which, 23 wait, years. There, I mean, I went to UCLA, so yay! <laughs> me too. You're a Bruin, so did Johnny. Really? Yes. <laughs> Go Bruins, right? I know. Johnny the, the had instant, like, the had a pretty amazing job back then. I mean, oh yeah, he did. Wow, you got stories. I know you got stories in there. One of my stories is uh, I had uh, I was an LA born boy who uh, wanted to make it in LA. Chris and I, when we were in San Bernardino, would often talk because we were two months apart in age. I think I'm the eldest. Or you are, aren't you? Yeah. Because you're eight, you're April. In any event, March. we were we were 20 something and we said, if we can just make it to LA by the time we're 30, we'll be huge. That'll be a huge monumental success and achievement in our minds. Well, we both got to LA at 22. Chris first, and then he drugged me in, thank God. <laughs> and uh, I got in at the same age. Wow. But I went away to El Paso, Texas to learn programming for four and a half years. Then I went to Chicago. And then on a vacation flight to LA, I met with the then program director of KFI, who was a mutual friend of uh, an old uh, boss of mine. And we had lunch and at lunch, ratings had just come out for LA and he had written them down on a napkin. He goes, what do you think of these? And I looked at him, I said, well, it's obviously a Hispanic rating period because KRLA did this and that. And as we left the restaurant, he goes, uh, when can you be here? I didn't know I was interviewing for a job. That was like a dream come true. I go, are you offering me a job? He goes, yes. When can you be here? And I said, well, it, two weeks and three days. It takes two weeks for me. I got to give the people in Chicago a two-week notice and then three days to travel across the country. He goes, get out of here. <laughs> Anyhow, I remember driving up Normandy to the Hollywood freeway. And I stopped back in the days of a paid telephone booth. And I called mom and dad. And I said, I'm coming home because they knew I wanted to go home. They, and I, and one of the comments I made is because it hit me while I was on the phone with my parent, parents was, oh my goodness, I'm going to be supervising Loman and Barclay. <laughs> <laughs> they to you know, it was, uh, it was a uh, miracle to say the least. What an incredible story. like a total life changer for you. Yeah. Yeah. And working with your dad and Roger was just, what a great thing to do. Um, 
I had a manager who wasn't a fan of Light of My Life. That was that. That's where the yin and yang happened for me, because he kept saying, "Get him, get him to compress it, compress it. It's running too long." And I, I don't know. To me, that was seventy-five percent of the appeal of listening to Loman Barkley and on KFI every morning. Well, and it's amazing. I got to tell you, it's like all these years later, I've got boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of light in my life and, and a lot of other stuff. So many people write me and say they were hooked on it. Like every oh, morning, yeah. they were children and they were riding in the cars with their parents going to school. They were telling me, how, and they're telling me these characters that I kind of remember and I kind of don't, but they were all such huge fans of it. I, I agree with you. To compress that would have been almost insanity. Because I don't know how my dad, who ad-libbed everything, I can't imagine him actually working off of something so he could have cut time, you know? Well, KFI helped form my opinion about radio research, too. Because uh, there had been a study, pardon me for the uh, doorbell, but, uh, <laughs> there had been a study done just before I came in from this group in uh, uh, Canada, who I don't want to name because... I don't want to embarrass them, mm -hmm. but it came. The study came back with three major things about how to improve KFI. One was get rid of the Dodgers. Chris, good move. <laughs> <laughs> that was the number one mistake, maybe in the long run. Go ahead. Number two was we have a problem because people had back in those days had to write down what they were listening to. There were no electronic devices, and. Some people within our company were upset that they would write down the Loman and Barkley state. They didn't write down KFI, <laughs> but we got credit for it, so who cares? And then the other recommendation was to get rid of Loman and Barkley. I just can't. They followed through with the Dodgers and got rid of them, which cost them dearly. Uh, but I just could never see making any uh, or proposing any replacement for Loman and Barkley. Oh, I mean, thank you. But I, especially that period of time. I mean, that period of time was, I mean, for you gentlemen, thank goodness you were part of all of that. I mean, it must have been an incredible <laughs> learning experience and, and just life experience. But on top of it, it's like they were such a sound, and I know I'm biased, but they were such a time, like a sound from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. There's, there's radio back then had a way of, marrying you and your family into their daily lives. It was more creative. It was more um, spontaneous. And, and to tell you the truth, it's like with the thing with Loman and Barkley or maybe Hudson and Landry or any of these other teams that were out there, they brought people into their world or Dick Whittington. I mean, what a wild life and crazy time he was, you know? It, 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 we're missing that now. And I think by back then, if, Getting rid of the Dodgers was really bad. Okay, really bad. I missed those seats that we used to get <laughs> where we would sit with the O'Malley's and then suddenly that and the, and the company, the company kept those seats too. Well, yeah. hello. They probably <laughs> still got them to this day, ringside right behind home plate. Wow. Wow. Four of them. Wow. Never got that, rid of them. So when they got rid of the Dodgers, that's when Loman and Barkley stopped going to Vero Beach, right? Correct, sure. because that's where spring training was for the Dodgers in uh, Florida. <laughs> they loved yeah. going. Oh yeah, they had a ball. I got, to, I got to go. That's I mean, it was fun. It was, and, fun. Uh, it was one of those situations where your dad uh, and Roger basically put their arms around me and, without saying, they said, "Kid, you're one of us." <laughs> and they just embraced me to the point where uh, I used to sit in the studio when they would start Love of My Life. And here's your dad going into his falsetto routine of <laughs> tons of voices. And then I would look at this guy. And of course, I was like about almost I was 30 then. And he, a grown man in his 50s, pushing 60, was acting like a five-year-old boy behind a microphone it just blew my mind I just thought what a talent this guy is to be able to shift gears like that 
And then he was so proud of the fact that you brought it up. He goes, rehearsal? No, we don't rehearse. We just, we just go That's, for it. It was and, hard. Um, right off the top of their head. Well, because when they went, they did the television shows. That was the hardest thing for my dad. I think Roger was much more um, grown up and much more organized <laughs> um, and much more based in reality than my dad. So when they were at television shows, you're supposed to have rehearsals, you know? Yeah. And my dad just thought they were a waste of time. We're just going to do it when we get there, you know? It was, it was amazing that what your dad could do, how many times he would just hit the desk for different sound effects. It was always him just pounding on the desk, but you'd believe a plane was going down <laughs> or someone was throwing up their lunch. <laughs> Did you guys hang with my with my dad and Roger? Did you guys like like go to lunch? Did you do such things with them? Well, I I did a little bit. I traveled with your dad to the Winter Olympics in 1978. Oh, oh you did that. And we were there in Canada together. And one of the great things was we showed up with no credentials. Of course, <laughs> I got to blame for that. But with your dad, we got into every venue I, 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 and interviewed everybody that we wanted to. We had a morning show that we did <laughs> in Canada, uh, tagged up with L.A., and uh, it was an unforgettable trip. Like I said, wow. we had no credentials, but with your dad, that was almost like we had we had whatever we wanted. <laughs> hey, Al, Plus. can you help me out? his jacket so he was so spontaneous he didn't bring his coat he had to buy a coat up there yeah, it's always warm in uh canada right just like la no. <laughs> no not in the winter in calgary <laughs> the winter olympics without a winter coat i mean yeah. <laughs> Unreal. I, bet, I bet that was really fun up there we had a ball wow. and uh, we were live in the lobby of uh, I believe it was the uh, Marriott Hotel in Calgary. And it was just one of those situations where we needed to have somebody who was a star in the Olympics. It was a medal winner or whatever. Al, can you get on the phone for me, buddy? Sure, no problem, Chris. <laughs> Hi, this is Al Lowen from Lowen and Barkley. Can we have your gold medalist uh, on the air? tomorrow morning. You bet, sir. Good to hear from you. <laughs> he was our credential. Credentials. <laughs> now, guys, you've worked in radio for so long. The two of you, I mean, your credentials are amazing. What was your favorite period of time in radio? I know that's a broad question, but there must have been a period of time that just is just sticks out in your head that you just every morning woke up and just had joy. I think when you're climbing the ladder, there's that period that you're talking about. And that would have been KFXM because both Chris and I wanted to be on a station so badly. And to which it was a major achievement, but you knew it was also going to be a springboard to bigger things if you had any talent at all. But, uh, when I got to KFI and Coast, uh, because of the manager who was Don Dalton, the general manager, who was your dad's boss, ultimate boss there locally, um, he just knew how to treat people. We, he would uh, set up a, a picnic lunch over at the equestrian center. Do you remember this, Chris, with a dunk tank? And he'd get in there and you're getting, by the way, your dad got all wet for the. For the <laughs> I'm sure he did. <laughs> yeah. He didn't let Don um, do <laughs> it was about fun. It, 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 it was, we knew it was a business and we had to achieve goals, but we did it with uh, a lot of uh, surprise and enjoyment along the way. Don Dalton was really a good person. I mean, he just, he was a very good general manager. I mean, I'm sure, I don't know what his background was before KFI and unfortunately he passed away so young. Yeah. But but what an amazing talent he was, you know. So he was good with everybody, huh? He, he was very proud. 
So, excuse me, Johnny. He was very proud, Kim, Don Dalton, of the fact that he had only gone to school through the eighth grade wow. and grew up on the south side of Chicago. Right. And back in that era, I don't know if you can remember or not, Johnny will probably remember, uh, WGN was uh, the Cubs' big first satellite type station that broadcast all the Cub games on TV and all you had to do is subscribe to WGN and be picked up by an affiliate. And uh, first thing everybody would always ask Don, Don Dalton, oh, you're probably a huge Cub fan. He goes, absolutely not. I love the Chicago White Sox. Well, they're on the <laughs> south, south side of Chicago. So that's <laughs> typical of Don Dalton. When you think you had him pegged, he'd throw something in there that would just be, oh my God, he's from the south side of Chicago. He doesn't give a damn about the Cubs. He's a White Sox fan. And he's <laughs> so proud of the fact too, at the same time wow. that his education was limited. He was a self-made man. And uh, he, he actually did some things where he would tell Johnny and I stories in a staff meeting. Just, yeah, I just got back from... Uh, down in Atlanta, and I had to straighten them out about uh, the, the station. He says, you know how I opened up the meeting? No, how, how'd you open up, Don? Because I took a pot of coffee and threw it up against the wall, and it broke, and all the oh, coffee what? everywhere, just oh. to get everybody's attention. Don was what you call a maverick, and there were very <laughs> few of boy in the radio business. Al Anthony was a maverick. Um, he would, one time I wanted to hire a talent and I asked Don to stay late at night. And you, Kim, you probably saw the KFI conference room. It had this very long conference table. Yes. And so I'm bringing this lady in to do love songs. It was uh, Jan Marie. And here's Don in jeans. And I can't remember what else. And he's laying on the table looking at the ceiling <laughs> when she walks in. <laughs> And I go, uh, Jan Marie, this is Don Dalton, the general manager. And she turns to me and goes, no, he's not. You're playing a prank on me. And she wouldn't accept the fact that he was the general manager. <laughs> that was Don. Yeah. Oh, my. And he had that voice. He had such a unique oh, voice. Yeah. Oh, my dad used to imitate him all the time. They called him Donald the, Don the Duck. Yeah. Uh, because he, he kind of had that quacky type voice. He was uh, very much like a father to me. I'll never forget one time we were flying back uh, from a corporate meeting in, the, in Atlanta. And Don would just have these moments, these little slices of time where he, uh, I don't know, he, we connected. And he looked at me one time, he goes, he always called me young man. He goes, uh, you really, uh, family means a lot to you, doesn't it, young man? And uh, I look at him like, how did you get that out of me? We never really discussed these things, but, uh, and I could tell it meant the same to him. And that translated into his employees. It was a family operation, right, Chris? Oh boy. And he would have Christmas parties yeah. that are to this day, legendary. I was about uh, to use that word. <laughs> legendary at the uh, most magnificent hotels in uh, Los Angeles. And here's the one thing, and Johnny will vouch for this. If you did not come to that Christmas party, <laughs> you probably wouldn't have a job in the following wow. year. And it's true. Wow. He took it personal. You wow. better be there because he's throwing the party and he expects everybody to be there. I wouldn't miss one of his parties for anything in the world because they were the best I'd ever been to. We were at the Century Plaza and we would have, uh, he would give away really good, I mean, uh, trip to uh, France and Switzerland, you know, wow. to employ, and a lot of things like that. And the, the person who just won the previous pot prize would put their hand into the jar and draw the next thing for the winner. And there was this wonderful vacation. I don't know if it was to Hawaii or overseas in Europe or someplace, but wow. we had this uh, janitor who, uh, his name's escaping me right now. I feel so bad. I don't want to say it was Carlos, but I could be wrong. 
anyhow, he, um, uh, Don stopped and he goes, because the janitor everyone knew was battling cancer. He goes, we have the, this is the next prize. And I don't think anyone will have any trouble whatsoever. if We just give it to, and he named them. And it was wonderful. I mean, he was, he, he just, he just knew how to create a team and a family. And your uh, father was a part of it, big part of it. I got to tell you that, you know, he has, he had fond memories of KLAC, obvious, for obvious reasons, because KLAC is where they got together. They had wild times at KFWB for the short period of time that that station still was a talk radio. I mean, uh, rock radio. But KFI was their meat and potatoes. I mean, that's where they really dealt in who they became. You know, in my opinion, when I listened to all their work, KFI just, and maybe it's because of people like Don Dalton, you know, it, 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 and you guys, it just seemed like everybody was close. Everybody was part of the show. So because of that, it just seemed like there was much more heart to the show, in, in my opinion. I was a f- uh, good friend of Rod Roddy. He was the announcer on the Price is Right television game show. Come on down. He wore, he's the one who wore the sparkly jackets all the time. And, and he would often, he, first of all, he was amazed that I was running KFI at one point. And he goes, Al Loman was one of the best disc jockeys I ever heard when he was in New York. Oh, goes, right. There was no one like Al Loman, and I never got to hear any of those air checks, but apparently, I mean, he impressed the professionals within the industry. I got to say, I'm lucky because of me being on, you know, some people like Facebook, some people hate Facebook. I, I like the internet just because it has brought me so many of the radio people together that have worked with my dad. You know, see, the, the problem with being a kid sometimes you, you don't realize, like I, my, I just took a grand who my dad and Roger were. Yeah, I, I didn't, I listened to them, but you know, I was a smart ass teenager. I'm listening to KMED, I'm listening to K-West, I'm listening to KLOS. And, and then I'd listen to my dad and I'd see all this and I'd go to the shows and I appreciated it, but as a kid. So what's interesting is hearing all of this stuff as an adult, I appreciate it more. So there's, being part of the internet, and this is a long way of, or to get to, the, to this one point. Um, there's a, a gentleman who's become a friend who had, I don't know how, air checks from my dad was in Dallas and uh, air checks from when he was at uh, WABC. Wow. And I got to tell you something, it is really weird to hear him Though I think he was good at WABC, don't get me wrong. It almost seems incomplete. You know, that Roger, Roger really, I don't think my dad would have been as big or as popular if it wasn't for the fact that Roger Barkley was in his life. I really think that that's where they came together. And my dad could then really grow and blossom. Uh, I could be wrong, but. Roger was program director of K. Uh, uh, KLAC? He was. So what happened was they, they kind of knew each other. You know, my dad would be at a station, then Roger would end up at that station. My dad would be at another station, then Roger would go there. And Roger knew of my dad. In fact, what's weird, and I really don't, I'll have to ask Nyla Barkley one day for the story, but somehow my dad's parents and the Barkleys knew each other before the kids knew each other in Iowa. And it's really this, I'm sure, bizarre story. But Roger's program director at KLAC, and my dad was at WABC. So Roger told my dad to, you know, or actually, Gary Owens was talking to Roger Barkley, Gary Owens, because Gary was everywhere. Gary knew, who didn't Gary know, right? Like Mr. Schmoozer, he got my parents together and he got my dad together with Roger. And uh, he, he told my dad, Roger was looking for some more talent. Roger asked my dad to come out from New York and Roger and Gary Owens were in Hollywood. My dad flew out and Gary introduced my dad to Roger. And they both, Roger was his boss. I, I have this beautiful letter that was handwritten that Roger wrote to my dad, welcoming him to the station, which is priceless. And, um, they were good, but I got to tell you, they, my dad almost lost his job because he wasn't as great as they thought he was going to be. Oh. 
And Roger, I guess, was kind of not doing so great as a program director. So the story has it, they went over to the smokehouse, got completely wasted, <laughs> listening to like maybe Sonny Bono or somebody like that at the piano over the smokehouse. And they decided to audition as a team and they auditioned as a team and they hired them and the rest is history. Wow. By yeah. the way, I want you to, uh, if you ever, right now it's on me TV at night, they run Adam 12 or late afternoon. And they're showing, I think season four of Adam 12, every season they change the opening, but one of the, in season four, and I wish I had video of it now here for you, the, they're rushing down Wilshire Boulevard. And if you look on the right side of the screen, there's K-L-A-C and the palm tree right in front of it, right there, when your oh, dad is there. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. La Brea, right? They, weren't, they, weren't they kind of close to La Brea Tar Pits over there? Right, right. Almost across the street. Yeah. That's so cool. You know, yeah, so okay. look for that on TV. I'm going to have to look for okay, because once, okay, so I decided that all the radio stations were the same. Like, I remember when I was a kid and KFI was over at, off of Vermont. Right. They had that beautiful stage back then. And uh, they had all this stuff from all these, like, you know, from, um, uh, I can't even think of anybody right now because I have no brain cells, but, but lots of these old radio shows and all their memorabilia and they kept everything. So silly me, when I started this process for this documentary, I thought, oh, all these radio stations, I'll just call up KLAC and they're gonna give me Loman and Barkley memorabilia. <laughs> They're bought out from so-and-so. And I kept talking to these people. I go, we don't keep that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Then I go to KFWB. I go, ah, they'll have it. No, they don't have it. And they don't even know what I'm talking about. And they didn't even know who Loman and Barkley was. And then I thought, KFI has got to have it. They got to have it. And I was told, I don't know if this is true, but they, they junked everything. Oh, no. And I hope that's not true because beyond Loman and Barkley, and I'm sure there's some stuff that was donated, but a lot of talent went through KFI. Oh, yeah. Like, a lot of you guys saw witnessed all this talent. Sure. I don't know if this is going to show up that well on <gasps> Zoom, but this is the opening of Adam 12. Uh, the tall building in the background there, if I can point to it, that's, yes. that's where CBS is. But this was KLAC right here. Let me see, that's if, I, so cool. let me see if I can play a little of that or not. I think it, yeah, here it comes. Where the palm trees are is KLAC. See the K? Uh, yes, I do. I'm, I'm running this in slow-mo right now. Here it comes. And that's the opening of Adam 12 back in the day. And oh, what's amazing is they are going over what would eventually, I, I work at CBS radio eventually. And this is my office right here. The next shot is over my office at CBS. Wow. So, I'm stuck. Okay, I gotta steal that from them. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got high quality video for you of it. Kent oh, McCord that... uh, on Adam 12 was about four years ahead of me in high school at Baldwin Park High. So he was like an idol of uh, all of us students, but just just a little tidbit of mem memories that trigger as soon as I hear about Adam 12 and uh, his, old par his old partner, used to call me at night when I worked at Cute 102 and request oh, records. And I, and I can't think of the actor's name off Martin. the top of Martin uh, Mil Milner. Martin Milner would call me, but uh, it, it's just those memories are priceless. Do you know and, who uh, Kent McCord's uh, friend was, Chris? His good buddy in school? Ricky Nelson. And they oh, yeah. Out. And they, they got, him, he got right. Kent McCord interested in acting. You are absolutely correct. They're buddies, UCLA. In fact, uh, wow. I believe uh, Ricky's wife was part of the uh, equation of everybody kind of knowing each other and when he was still just a kid on the show and when he first got married. Kim, wow. your father must have met some heads of state. Who was the most famous person he felt he ever, you know, <laughs> okay. spent so, time with? Kind of a difference with my dad on who was the most um, important person he met 
or who's the most important person that might my dad like very eclectic people um i would say so funny my, i would say george carlin and pat mccormick were probably two of the people that he i know they're not i mean I know they're not the huge, you know, like dignitaries, but they're the ones that he adored. He adored comics. He adored yeah. funny people. And, you know, he, he used to have, he used to have people like Jonathan Winters used to call up our house and character at wow. all <laughs> hours of the night. Great. And my dad would talk in character back to Jonathan Winters. <laughs> These calls would go, Oh, one, two, three hours long. Um, he, he, Paul Winter was a good friend of my dad's and they would have some really strange conversations. So my, my dad was starstruck with so many people, but I think the ones that meant the most to him were the people that make him laugh because he, his, one of his childhood fantasies was to meet become like Bob and Ray and I think that was Rogers too and they got to meet them mm -hmm. and that was also a very big moment in their life it, it yeah. my dad just he would be so intimidated by these people but at the same time he was so so enamored with their humor I think you know his goal in life was to make people laugh that's what did, he wanted to do did he your father was, work with Tim Conway it, or or know him knew him very very well in fact Roger was probably the closest out of the two Tim actually spoke at Roger's um memorial um they loved Tim Conway they loved um uh Newhart Bob Newhart they they but they didn't this is interesting between the two of them I think they were they put so much into their early morning show, they didn't really socialize as much as people would think. They went to events, which I think are different. They didn't, they didn't have kind of like, like I heard that Tim Conway liked to hang out with, you know, like, uh, uh, oh my God, the, the, the guy who used to call people hockey, pan, um, hockey pucks, um, Don Rickles. Don they used to hang out and be really close friends or, they go out like Newhart would go out with them and all this stuff. My dad and Roger were so wiped out from waking up at four o'clock in the morning that I think they were kind of duds for the rest of the day. You know, I mean, it was really an exhausting <laughs> schedule. Like that. I think that's why at the end, Roger was just like, I'm done. You know, well, I'm I mean, not a morning person. We have to rely on Chris. Chris, did they always get there at the same time? They, no. they, they didn't prepare, did they? <laughs> No, in fact, uh, one of the great stories that I love to tell is uh, it's five o'clock in the morning or 5.30 and we're getting ready to go on the air. And I looked at Roger and I said, Roger, after all these years, getting up early is getting easy and easy for you and it's not a problem, right? And he goes, he goes, I hate it. It's still <laughs> the worst thing about the job. I do not like waking up early, but you'd never know it because he was the one that was really running the show. He was the straight man. He had the turntables. He punched up the uh, sound effect carts, except when Al was hitting the desk, like Johnny said. Or my dad. Oh, oh your dad. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Every sound effect that uh, his body could manufacture was on the air. And, uh, that's what made them so funny is that they were so natural, I think. And I'm trying to remember if it's correct. And I'm paraphrasing. Roger told me that as time went on, they were so good, good friends in the beginning that they actually thought if they hung out too much post-show, it would take away from the morning. They really and felt I that. Thought, I thought, you know what? That's a good point. And they both kind of went for it. Not that they didn't like each other still or love each other, really. And I know the breakup was tough because I was there when the breakup happened. But um, I think part of the longevity and the success of the duo was they did exactly like you said, Kim. They, they didn't socialize together after the show, whether they were tired or not. 
I think it was almost something you both agreed to. You know, I agree. And I have to say my dad over the years, my dad was probably closest, the person closest to him was probably Roger Barkley, even closer than he was to my mom. Wow. They had, um, had a very unique situation. My dad was very off the wall and very on and very funny, but he didn't let a lot of people in. He was very extroverted towards people and very inclusive, but people would walk away not really 100% knowing him. Maybe it's the Midwest thing, maybe it's self-protection, mm -hmm. but Roger got to see my dad warts and all. And they, even at the end, I think we were talking about this the last show, you know, it was so traumatic when they broke up, so traumatic. And, you know, my, my dad, basically, he went to his grave regretting the day that he stopped talking to Roger and Roger went to his grave regretting the same thing. And when I got a hold of the Barclays after my dad passed away, we both kind of healed both families because of that. It, it, they were so close. It was almost like there was no other place to go, you know? And professionally, um, they were close too, Kim. You know how, how some two person uh, shows, they can cue each other, like you take it and no, I've got it, or they at least glance at the person. Roger could just be working, and in his peripheral vision, he knew that Al was going to come in, your dad, and Al was the same way. They kind of were in their own little bubbles, even though they, they were almost, you know, just 90 degrees opposite, opposite one another at the console, but uh, they could just anticipate what the other person was going to do. Which is amazing. You know, I, like I said before, I really think the two of them on their own, but they were good. You know, they were fine. I don't think they were as good without each other. And that's with both men. That's with my dad, because my dad, after Roger and he broke up, you know, I heard him with Gary. I heard him over down in Cape Palm and stuff like that. And hey, it wasn't the same. It really was not the same. And I heard Roger when he was at um, KBC. Yeah, you see. No, before that, he was at, who was the Muzak station? Yeah, he had a short little- K-Joy, was it K-Joy back then or K-Big? Yeah. It was Coast, it wasn't Coast, I was- <laughs> No, not you, not, not you. Um, K-Joy, he was at K-Joy and then yeah. a short time. And then he teamed with uh, Ken. In many, in many years. Um, <laughs> yeah, what's- Yeah. It was fine. I mean, I think that Roger's a talent. Ken Minyard is okay. Ken but... Barkley. It didn't work in my, I mean, and I'm prejudiced, I'm prejudiced, but I heard that also went out with the bang, unfortunately too, you know? Sure. I, think, I think my dad and Roger were destined to be together. I really do. I, I think that that's, and that's just from, you know, it's funny when you're a kid, you take a lot of things for granted, but when you hear the stuff that I've been hearing and talking to people, I, I think that they were better as a team. I think they, they, they belong together. It was heartbreaking. Uh, I didn't know that there were problems. Uh, my GM apparently did, Don Dalton. And uh, the breakup happened. And I came into work one day and Don called me into the office and told me. And it was like, wait a minute, I don't have Loman and Barkley to work with? I mean, starting immediately? What do we do? We ended up... Uh, we went, and Chris, you might remember the, uh, the order, but we had Gary Owens, we had Jeff Edwards. Uh, who else did we have in there? And we tried, no one could replicate, and taking, taking nothing away from the other talents that followed, but no one could take away from the pyramid that Loman and Barkley had built. Thank you. And, I think and, and, and the same thing for Ken Minyard, who we both respect and have a lot of uh, admiration for. Great guy on the air, did his number, but Ken and Barkley just did not work uh, like Loman and Barkley. And nothing against Ken Minyard because he did a super job in the morning and had great ratings. And but with it Ken just Bob, wasn't the same. Ken and Bob were. Ken and they, Bob was, was after that. They were, but Ken and Bob, well, no, Ken and Bob was before 
Mark, Ken, Winnie. Um, and Ken and Bob was like, I mean, they were, they, they, they did a good job. Like, what's that? They did a good job. They did do a good Ken job. Bob, yeah. They had they, Ebok. They, they gave Loman and Barkley. I mean, they were targets of one another. They, they sure. gave them a run. Yeah. Was Hudson and Landry also at that time? Were they also like, was it the three? The Hudson three and Landry were on KGBS, which I also work at, uh, but they were doing afternoons. Oh. I was thinking of them, of them earlier today. It's amazing you brought up their names. Did they ever go in the mornings, Chris? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, eventually. And uh, that's where uh, Sharon Dale did news on their show was when they had the morning show. And I don't know if you remember that or not, but uh, she was always a target that they loved to play with uh, on their show. But uh, <laughs> th those, those combos could not match Alan Roger. They're, they're just not even close when they were going head to head. And your father was very, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, it's not affable. But, uh, if you, if I had to work with him because I was his director, quote unquote, um, and give him some notes, uh, he wanted direction, which is always the sign of a true talent. Talent says, tell me where to stand. Tell me which hand to hold the coffee cup in, you know, tell me how I should read the line. Um, and, and he was, he just soaked that up. He, uh, he never pushed back. Um, <laughs> I, I will admit, though, a couple of times I wanted certain things on the air and I'd sit and talk to him and he was committed and I thought, great, we're, you know, and I tune in tomorrow morning and it wasn't there. <laughs> he was back to his old tricks. <laughs> he was, he was, he was the type that he could make everybody feel good, but he would do things his own way. He just, it was very hard to make him mad. If you made him mad, it was, but I he never got mad at you. I hope not. I, you know, I, no. I, I, I just, I was privileged to be in a position to even be in the same room with them. No. I do want to mention one thing. They were so creative. And you know, we had gotten them a star on the Walk of Fame, which back then cost 20000 or whatever, and the station had paid for it. We're doing it on Vine Street near, uh, Sunset Boulevard in front of the, uh, pretty near to the old uh, 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 Brown Derby. And um, I don't know how they're gonna show up. They haven't discussed this with promotions or me or anyone. And here comes the limo up Vine Street with Al hanging out, waving to the crowd and poor Rogers running behind in a tuxedo like, wait for me, wait for me. They just knew how to pull off comedy in an instant. Yeah. They were fast. And I remember that day. And somebody, and I don't know who this is, somebody posted that whole thing. And it has to be somebody from the station. It has to be. It's me. You! I shot it. I shot You're all of that. You're my best friend. Oh. I just <laughs> that. <laughs> because I'm like, who? It's on YouTube. I love that. <laughs> you, it was so, and, I'm, and I'm looking going, where did this come from? Yeah. It's brilliant. You got everything. It was I tried to. Yeah. Okay, it's you want to hear old technology, but we captured what we could. No, it's beautiful, and it captures that day so perfectly. And it's everybody. Don Dalton's in there. Bruce Wayne is in there. Yeah. I mean, Johnny is in there. I mean, everybody's in there. Now, here's a funny story. I like every few years go and visit the star because. I'm the only one that lives in LA. I'm hokey enough to sit there and watch my dad star and Roger star and make it all pretty. So it used to be a parking lot that was next door to the star. So one day I'm going down and they lifted it. They lifted all the, not just their star, but everybody's star because they're going to build this building. And they sure they put them someplace for safekeeping. So when they finish the building, I come back and you know how the stars have in the middle something that represents the stars. You know, like there's some microphone for radio people, a movie camera for the movie people. Yeah. They have a movie camera in the middle of theirs. <laughs> <laughs> the and Chris, is... Chris, some poor schmuck in the movie's got a microphone. <laughs> I know. They got a microphone. Yeah. Like, right? <laughs> I think it's hysterical. It's like, oops. 
Yeah. <laughs> I know, and I didn't even notice it. I'm like a polishing the star. And some fan said, did you notice when you posted the picture that it's gone? It's like, I got to talk to my guest, but I like it this way. It's kind of funny, right? <laughs> it is really neat that they have that there. I got to say, it, it's, it's, it's pretty special. And the station was pretty right on that they did that for them. Now, the sick part is they're not in the Radio Hall of Fame. That's, that's the part that I do not understand in any way, shape, or form. I don't, have, I don't understand how they're not in the Radio Hall of Fame. That's just wrong. Yeah. I, well, and that's why I'm hoping like the film will get them into it because it's, it's, there's so many people that deserve it to be in it. I really, we're, you know, I'm sorry, the 60s, 70s, and 80s had talent that was, and even beyond that, but those are at least the ones I can relate to. Unbelievably talented people. And when I look at the roster with the people that are in there, they all deserve to be in there. They yeah. really do. I mean, they created what we, we, we look back at and think nostalgically about, but Loman and Barkley's not in there. And that just is crazy. The only wrong that equals that in my mind is when I worked at WCFL in Chicago, we had a campaign to get the Three Stooges a star on the Walk of Fame because no one had ever done that. And they were, for some reason, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce was not proposing it. And we thought it was so wrong that that hadn't occurred decades earlier. And, but they do have a star, don't they? Yeah, I think they do now. As a Near point. Loman and Barkley. Oh. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, because, you know, you, you have when you go down there. Now, I don't know if you guys ever go down there anymore, because <laughs> it's not exactly the nicest part of town at the time. But if you go to the Pantages, it's like, heck, you got to go walk the stars, you know? And right there, that's where they are. I and remember your dad, when we were first mentioning that he was going to get uh, a star in the Walk of Fame, he wanted to know what sex shop it was in front of. <laughs> <laughs> or tattoo parlor. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I love that. Now, so I know Loman and Barkley are your favorite talents that you guys have worked with, but name some other people that you really were impressed that you guys got to work with. Chris? Well, I'm thinking with Gary like, Owens when I'm we think Gary Owens. Yeah, well, Gary, I worked with Gary after the breakup, and uh, you know, he's legendary, obviously. Oh yeah. And just about as good a guy as there is. Uh, I think probably Alan Roger might be tied with him as far as just good people that um, they cared about the people they work with. And uh, you talked about how your dad wouldn't let anybody in. I kind of felt like he let me in whenever we were out somewhere and like the trip to Calgary for the Winter Olympics. He would always be going, Chris, what can I get for you? What, oh, can, I, can, I go can I go grab a, a coffee for you? Can I get an orange juice? Oh. I, what, 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 what do you need? I'm, I'm gonna run up my room right now. He was oh, always that's... like looking out for me personally. And I kept thinking, Al, I, I'm okay. Take care <laughs> of yourself, buddy. And uh, he was awesome. one of those type of people like the other two, Roger and uh, uh, Gary, that uh, just made you feel special. And uh, like you said, your dad didn't let everybody in, but you knew when you were in with him. You and sure it did. was almost to the point where, God, what else do I need to do? I just, I just want to be around him. I love uh, working with him on the air. But uh, uh, I think maybe Mark and Kim over on the coast might be another couple. But uh, I just really enjoyed being around both of them. Oh, and, that's uh, Yeah, well, I, I tell you, what, one's AM, one's FM. And I did sports on both of their shows. And uh, that's about as good as it gets as far as talent is concerned that, that I have worked with. And uh, Johnny Kay, of course, is the best program director I've oh. ever set eyes on, period. We're, we're good buddies and we helped each other along the way. But uh, man, he is uh, right up there with the best of them and a talent that uh, intellect 
programming wise, producing. It's like when you said, God, you got everything you shot in the uh, parade for the Hall of Fame. And no. he says, well, I try. And that's because he's a perfectionist. You better believe it. Ancient quality cameras, film, and he makes it work. And I've seen that clip. It's a uh, tremendous. It's amazing. It's amazing. In fact, yeah, the best. Johnny, I'm sorry. I, I put it on my Facebook wall maybe once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Maybe we're up to six views now. <laughs> John, you've worked with some pretty good talented uh, guys besides, and, and ladies besides uh, Alan Roger. Yeah, I, you know, the amazing thing about working with Alan Roger. Yeah, I, I worked with Fred Winston, who was famous in, in Chicago, and, and everyone's name is escaping me right now. And before I got the KFI, I was not a KFI listener, because I was coming from out of state anyhow. I knew my parents knew who Loman and Barkley were, and they were listeners. And I knew Loman and Barkley had been on uh, television and done various shows. But they had this reputation and that phone call, I'm going back to that phone call from that phone booth. I mean, I was just, it was like God shine a light on me for some, how did I ever get the privilege to work with Loman and Barkley? Uh, name did come to mind, obviously. I, I, I can't believe I, I, this one escaped me, but Dick Clark, I worked with too. Oh, sure. Wonderful human being. <laughs> In a different way from your your father and Roger, uh, but there is something in in their DNA and their persona. You just recognize it. You almost feel it when you're in their presence. Not to make them icons or, or godlike in any any way, but when people have that magnetism and can make you smile. Uh, it really touches your heart and, and you know what's happening. Well, and those those are the people that that make us feel good. You know, I mean, I, I think Dick Clark is a, was an amazing human. I mean, you guys have mentioned people, Gary Owens. Gary Owens, I knew all my life and what an incredible human being he was. I mean, and like I said, I don't think he's, he, he, there's not a person on the planet he hadn't met. I mean, he was just one of those people that just, you know, the more the merrier, you know? Um, but, you know, my, my, my dad and Roger were very, very lucky to have, have, be working with you. I mean, very lucky. And I'm an absolute privilege that they work with you and you too, Chris. I mean, you guys made it, you were part of their family, you know? And that's- well, when, I, when I got that job at UCLA, and into it because I was there for 23 years as the voice of the Bruins. Both of them would come by and see me, whether at a game or whatever. And it was almost like, hey, there's our boy. <laughs> Good to see you, buddy. How's it going? And Al uh, would just come over and put his arm around me and give me a big hug. And Roger, who catered with uh, the restaurant Barkley in the uh, Rose Bowl oh. would bring us in the booth steaks, prime rib, oh. baked potatoes. You can't eat them when you're on the air. <laughs> like, Roger, what are you doing? He goes, oh, you deserve it. Are you, 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 are you kidding? You're part of the Loman and Barkley lore. Like, and proud to be part of it, too. Thank oh. you, sir. Both of you. Him after the breakup, I didn't know where I stood with either Roger or your father. I didn't know if I was part of the problem because I was wanting wanting them to make certain oh. formatic changes with, within the program, and I didn't know if my my demands per se were too much for them or whatever. I later learned that I had nothing to do with the breakup. Yeah, nothing. I I didn't reach out to either one because I had no idea where I stood within their oh. you know within their minds. And one day I ended up at Bark. I was driving up La Crescenta, La Kenyatta, and I saw Barkley's restaurant. I went in. I said, "Is Roger Barkley the owner?" Yeah, and I, you know, he's in the bar, and we'll tell him you're here. And I went. I, I had this great <laughs> hesitation, and Roger came out, and I stood up, and he hugged me, 
And I mean, you know, when someone hugs you and squeezes you and it means something, that happened with Roger. Now, in terms of your father, he had gone out to, was it Palm Desert or Palm Springs? Um, actually, Rancho Mirage, but it's the same thing. He went down to the desert, you know? Okay, he was out in the desert. And he called me one time and he was asking advice. Oh. And I was, I was, again, I felt so privileged. And he wanted, he wanted to know if it was over for him. Oh, and, that's so sad. And uh, meaning his act. Yeah. And because he wasn't getting responses. And just the other day, it's funny, I should think of this right now. I was going through a bunch of old audio files and I had some files of telephone calls. And I'll be happy to give it to you. It's a call from your father asking me if I can put the bug in someone's ear in LA radio to at least listen to his tape or take his phone call. Oh. And I remember hanging up the phone and just feeling so drained from that experience because it, it made me feel bad, bad that this, this magnificent icon of the broadcasting industry thought that maybe time had passed him by. You know, the thing with my... The thing with my dad was this. My dad had, um, when he was younger, all the way up until the end of Philomena Barclay, everything, I'm not going to say he didn't work for it, but his opportunities came easily for him. And, and every time he like moved from station to station before Roger, it was bigger and better, you know? And then when he got to the LA market, they always landed on their feet. Even when KFWB went under and they had no idea where they were gonna work, they, they landed KFI. I mean, he just, they had the television shows and even though they had setbacks, he always landed on his feet. And with Roger, he always landed on his feet. But people usually came to my dad. You know, there's certain people that are go-getters and then there's certain people that are not that type of person at all. You know, he was such a Midwesterner, he didn't know if things were going to be rude to ask such things, you know? And uh, it's funny that you say that, that he did, he did, that he felt very obviously incredibly comfortable around you. I think my, my dad's biggest thing was he thought after the breakup, people would come to him, you know? And I, I mean, they did in the sense of like Gary, he and Gary talked and he teamed with Gary for a while. Um, he did some Tom Snyder stuff, wonderful Tom Snyder. Um, but I think people thought he would have representation that would put him out there. And that's, that didn't happen. So at the end, you know, he's down at this station down in Palm Springs and he was used to the big leagues and people didn't come to him anymore. And I think he, it really was very, very deflating to him at the, at the end. He was pretty depressed at the end, unfortunately. Well, Chris and I, lo I, I can speak for Chris because I know it's true. We love your dad so much Thank on you. so many different, professionally and otherwise. Um, I'm kind of curious because I've never gotten to speak to you about this and, and I'm not sure you want to put it out there, but what was your father's emotional state of mind before he passed about life, career, family, all that? Well, you know, he died very, very quickly. He, he had bladder cancer. And mm -hmm. without going into all of that, it, it took him very quickly. He had, um, you know, my dad, my dad didn't like to hear bad news. You know, he didn't like to hear bad things. So part of it, I think, was him ignoring the news and part of it, I think, just the wrong doctors. And without going into all of that, when he was going through that, he was, I'd say he was depressed. He missed the old days. Um, we talked about it a lot. He talked about the biggest regret of his life was not calling Roger Barkley when he heard that Roger was dying. That was the biggest regret of his life. And uh, this makes me tear up because when I called Nyla after, Nyla Barkley, after um, my dad died, she said that was Roger's biggest regret too. And, and that's special to me. I mean, I know that sounds, 
that sounds kind of uh, hokey, but it showed that they had that much love for each other. Yeah. My, my dad really, really loved his family. My brother and I, um, there's just the two of us and my mom and his sister. I mean, he loved his life. He loved his people. He loved his life. He missed what he had. And I think that's the saddest thing. I think that's why he died so young. I mean, he was only 69 when he died. Yeah. So it's, you know, he, he wished he could have taken it back. And there's, there's so many conversations we had about a lot of choices that were made. And I think, I think he died knowing he, he said to everything to most people what he needed to say, but I think he, he died with a lot of regrets, which is a shame. Yeah. Where's your father? Um, he's in Molokai. <laughs> he's in the ocean. Oh, um, okay. yeah, my dad, my dad's ashes were scattered in Molokai. It was one of his absolute hands down, most fabulous place in the planet. And it's funny, like when he died, I went through all these things and he had like 15 books on, um, what's his name? Father Flanagan. Is that was his, the, 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 the guy who took care of the lepers on Molokai, my oh, dad, okay. Father Damien, he just had, Damien, right, right. he loved that place. So he got his ashes scattered over in that cove, which was lovely. Um, and my mom passed yeah. away about almost 11 years ago. So no parents left, you know, unfortunately. And we're all in the same boat there, right, Chris? You are absolutely correct. And I can say one thing, Kim, you're uh, carrying the torch of uh, Al Loman beautifully. Thank you. And I'm sure glad that you've included me and Johnny uh, on part of this little episode because those were special years for us when we were around Al and Roger. And uh, Al Loman is about as good as I get for me. Thank you. You know what? I. It, it wouldn't be complete without you guys. It, it really wouldn't. And, you know, it's, I, I, I want to make sure, I, I feel like my job right now, I mean, is to make sure that Loman and Barkley gets out there, really gets out there and gets in, inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame. When I have these two projects done, then I'll feel like I'm, I respected my dad and Roger in the fullest, because to me, Roger is also a parent. He's part of, he's my family. Chris, wasn't Al very influential with the after negotiations between talent and the union? You know, I'm really glad you brought that up because Al and Roger, every single gathering, us regular staff announcers, we're going to be there to try to get the best contract we could. That's the way you negotiated it back in those days with uh, the American Federation of Radio and Television Artists. But at every single meeting, and I mean every one, Al and Roger were there, and it would blow the minds of regular staff and officers. Norman and Barkley are here, and your dad, along with Roger, would say, Hey, listen, we're here to support you because we have been there. We've had to go through tough times, and we're part of this group, and we want you to know we support you 110 and I never forgot that. I thought, wow, here's a couple of superstars. I thought they were always superstars, but they would back the regular staff announcers and the meetings and the negotiations with the American Federation of Radio and Television, Television Artists. And it meant a lot. Big wow. time. That is such a cool story. That is, well, my dad, my dad felt everybody was his family. He felt everybody's foundation was his family. I mean, and I'm sure Roger felt the same way. It's like, how could you not support your family? You know, that's a great story. I have had the most amazing time talking to you gentlemen. Um, and what a privilege to talk to Johnny Kay and to Chris Roberts. Um, you guys have brought so many memories and I've just learned so much from both of you. Thank you. Kim, you're carrying the torch uh, for the Loman family beautifully. We Thank love your dad. It's been a pleasure on my part. And I know Johnny feels the same way, right, Johnny? 
you bet. It was such a privilege to be able to call him a friend, let alone work with him. Oh, thank you guys. I'm going to be picking your brains in the future. I know it. You're just great. Um, I just have one thing to say to you both. And they all lived happily ever after. Thank you.